I have to admit I was a little disappointed when I came in and I saw the program that the Steely Dan lyrics weren't on there because I very much wanted them to be. And then uh, Leslie read them and I thought, that's terrific because uh, I was kind of hoping that we would just sing them on the way out. I mean, the, the greatest song ever about Bodhi's Atlas is, you know, should be included in this, in this talk. Uh, secondly, my wife, who is here and is one of the kindest, if not kindest, persons I know, uh, is much farther along the Buddhist path than I, even though she has studied it and practiced it far less, did lean over to me and whisper, you know, when you get to the, the Sanskrit and the Tibetan terms, can you just slow down and maybe enunciate those kind of, you know, carefully? So uh, I'll try to do that. Third thing before I get started is, I uh, love that quote from the Dalai Lama, I'm a big fan of, of of his, but just in the interest of full disclosure, uh, he has several books out that are, uh, one, of, one of them is called, by the way, da The Dalai Lama at Harvard. Uh, it's quite complicated and quite philosophical, uh, and so he can go there if he, if he needs to. He's not just this simple monk uh, that he pr sometimes pretends to be. Um, you always do me a favor when you ask me to come out to speak. It's helpful for me to reflect on whatever topic it is I'm asked to speak on. In this case, metta or loving kindness in the Buddhist tradition. And in preparing for this, uh, I got to take a little trip down memory lane when I first got introduced to Buddhism as a college student and then many, many treks through India and Ladakh and Tibet and China and Southeast Asia looking for something as 20-somethings often um, tend to do. Uh, and, and I was able to reflect on the innumerable kindnesses done to me, for me, performed for me, by people who had no particular vested interest. They didn't, they didn't know me. There was no financial gain to be had. Um, there was a kind of loving kindness that I encountered on many of these trips that literally, I think, kept me alive, where I had eaten something I shouldn't have eaten or took the wrong turn on a 20,000-foot mountain pass or something. <laughs> and, and, all these people kept me alive. And so I, I got to think about that, and I thought about all the, the intentions, the motivations, the aspirations I had to develop in myself something like loving kindness uh, and finding the Buddhist tradition a way to do that. On the other hand, very, very humbling experience um, because when I think about what loving kindness is, what it, what it demands, this kind of equanimity, this kind of calm, this wish for all sentient beings, to realize peace, happiness, uh, freedom from suffering, that sort of thing, and the role that any one of us can play in helping bring that about. On a daily basis, if I'm lucky on my better days, I get to a kind of state that we might call grouchy tolerance for the other people in my life, uh, even those I'm really close to and who love me despite uh, the states of being that I often exhibit. Um, so as you see, there's a bit of a gap there. So just full disclosure that the person delivering this uh, short talk on loving kindness um, still sees it as this kind of um, reach exceeding grasp business. Though, to be fair to me in all this, apparently I am not the only one with this difficulty. I'm not the only person on the planet who finds it difficult to be uh, gracious and loving and kind to all comers, no matter the hatred, rage, or stupidity they might display. <laughs> uh, this goal is a worthy one, uh, how attainable it is, um, and what it takes to attain it is, not, is no small thing. Um, we'll talk about the Bodhisattva vow a little bit and, and some of the Bodhisattvas. Avalokiteshvara, see, now I thought about it and I screwed up. Avalokiteshvara in particular. All right, and I might, might even have been skeptical of the whole Buddhist enterprise early on, coming from a rationalist, Western philosophically trained tradition. Um, if I hadn't taken these trips and actually met people who seemed pretty darn close to the, the, the very ideal that was being held up in their own tradition. There was a kind of, and it does translate this way, both from Tibetan and, and Sanskrit. And uh, one of my instructors at, at Harvard, who has trained many of the, the great Buddhist scholars, um, 
always translated this way too. So there's kind of a spiritual friendliness about somebody who's on the bodhisattva path. It, friendliness is really the word. Let's think of the best sense of what a friend. A friend is really happy to see you almost always, right? <laughs> almost all, under any circumstances. There's a hug, there's a warmth, there's a genuine care for one's, one's being and go and you find the things you have in common and you enjoy each other. And I don't know. I mean, I, I did have the privilege of meeting the Dalai Lama once. Maybe behind closed doors, he is really just some regular guy in a wife beater who, you know, has pops a few beers and, you know, just kind of laughs at all of us who are drinking the Kool-Aid. I don't know, but I get it. In person, he is even better than advertised. I mean, in his presence, and I felt this way with a number of other Buddhist teachers too. Gail Rinpoche in Ann Arbor, who founded Jewel Heart, who just died a couple of years ago, was a teacher to me. Um, there's a kind of openness that, that is just rare in my experience, and a kind of concentration, a kind of ability to be present in the face of your dread and anxiety, pettiness, jealousies, insecurities, uh, and, and accept those and love you and see the best of you and want to bring out the best of you. That is just um, exhilarating on one hand and, again, deeply humbling um, on, on the other. So for me, anyway, I, I have found Buddhism, especially in its Tibetan form, the thing that's probably most descriptively and prescriptive, prescriptively true about our, at least our inner world, whether all of their cosmologies really correspond with what we know from science about the outer world is less important to me. But as a depth psychology, about a guide for understanding who and what we are and who we might be, can be, uh, I really have found them uh, wildly instructive. They're up there with Dostoevsky and Philip Roth, I would say. So, um, and, and probably the, uh, the reason that I'm not even harder to live with than I, than I might be. <laughs> All right, so loving kindness, metta. Got to say just a word about Buddhist philosophy before we get into um, a, a practice. And I hope you don't mind if we do a little actual practice of, of metta or, or loving kindness to show you rather than just tell you what that's like. Um, there's no initiation or anything. There's no fee for that. Uh, if it takes and, and you find it useful or helpful, that's terrific. Borrow it without designating it Buddhist. It doesn't mean you have to go around showing off now and saying, oh, I think I'm a Buddhist. You know, everything like that. Um, but there are commitments in, involved in actually taking a, a step on the Bodhisattva path. There are variously, depending on the schools, 13 or 14 of the Bodhisattva stages. They are marked by certain kinds of signs, insights, um, characteristics, uh, personalities. And you can't see it very well, I apologize for that, but I did bring Avalokiteshvara with me. I think you should go wherever one goes. He is generally considered to be the most significant or, eight, or, or archetypical bodhisattva of compassion. Um, in the Tibetan um, subsection of, of Buddhism, it's called the Vajrayana, um, all of these wildly artistic representations at, at their ultimate level most profoundly should be understood as pictorial representations of our own mind, uh, representations of particular energies, psychic capabilities, possibilities within each one of us that get um, then find artistic form that we can resonate with, meditate on, uh, try to conceptualize ourselves as. Anyway, the, everybody's human. Even the Buddha is a human. There's no godlike or, or, or intrinsically god-like quality. These are all human developments, human possibilities. But the human who becomes Avalokiteshvara, the human bodhisattva, um, is walking along one day, meditating on not only his own suffering but the suffering of others, and having been somewhat steeped or, or at least heard about the Buddhist tradition, he takes the bodhisattva vow. Beings are innumerable, I, I vow to, to save them all. Suffering is endless, I vow to end it. Uh, this wildly aspirational thing. And uh, he pauses for a second, it dawns on him what he's just vowed to do, and his head explodes. Poof! Into uh, lots of little pieces. <laughs> and the story is, uh, it takes the Buddha himself and a couple of other bodhisattvas, Vajrapani and some of the others, 
they come along and they see him, they say, well, you know, just what he's up about, you know, it happens. <laughs> and, and they put him back together in this form. They said, well, if you're really going to do all this, you're going to need 11 heads, you're going to need 1,000 arms, you're going to need a lot more than, than you have now. And again, what do we need? So there are lots of different practices in, in, in terms of developing that, that cultivation of ways to overcome what they consider to be the three root delusions, so psychological in this sense, uh, anger, ignorance, and greed. Greed probably is better understood, too, in, in the Buddhist context. It's not so much greed for material things, though that plays into it. It's, it's the greediness that things be permanent, the greediness about things or people or ideas, holding fast, staying as they are, and making me feel exactly the way I feel now forever. Don't go changing, right? High school yearbooks. Don't ever change. You're just, you're really, 17 years old, don't ever change? Oh! <laughs> what kind of advice is that? It's terrible. <laughs> and so, as you know, the great Buddhist insight, one of them is uh, things are not doing nothing but changing all the time. Impermanence is one of the hallmarks of, of our lives. If you're the same now as you were at 10, physically, psychologically, emotionally, intellectually, um, you need somebody other than me to help you <laughs> grow grow out of that. But it is psychologically, right, and emotionally where so many of us get, get stuck. So many triggers, so many uh, obstacles, so many points that where we get blocked. And meta, loving kindness, is one of the ways um, that we can get out of that. But what, what are the bodhisattvas, what are the Buddhists exactly saving us from? They want us to be woke, awakened, enlightened. From what? From, from our ignorance from our greed, from the, the anger. And anger, you know, again, number of connotations in Buddhism, but the anger often that comes that, that people are not loving me the way they should. They're not recognizing me for my the fullness of my greatness and everything that's wonderful about me. Not getting what you think you want, deserve, should have. And then existentially, anger, it, this is all going to go, things are just going so well. I finally got things figured out, and now I'm 70,000 years old. I'm going to die. All right? So that sense that even when life is good, there's a kind of end. Yeah, there's a cyclical nature to it. Um, it's hard to extend that. So anger. Um, on, a, on a much, much smaller base level, but I think probably easier to understand in terms of the practice of loving kindness, um, I like to use driving. Grand Rapids, for those of you who know it or spend any time there, is, is we are a victim of our success. We're doing incredibly well. I chalked that up largely to Grand Valley and the professors there. But, uh, <laughs> but we're doing really well. And it means people are coming from everywhere and they're settling in Grand Rapids. And then they have the temerity to take their cars out on the road and drive them next to mine. What the hell are they thinking? But that has to stop. Um, and so one of my basic practices of loving kindness, it's kind of a litmus test, gives me a sense of how well I'm doing is how many times I raise a particular finger, you know, in the course of any driving day. And somebody got, it's Sunday morning, I'm driving out here to give a talk on loving kindness, right? <laughs> and the universe is funny. I don't know if the Buddha is behind us. I don't think so. <laughs> but I'm driving along at 96, you know, it's perfectly pleasant. I'm just doing 70 because I just don't feel like going any faster, you know, just driving along, enjoying the fog. And this young woman comes right up on my tail their lights on. It's like, there's another lane. There's nobody else here. <laughs> it's like, and I'm being all loving kindness, you know, I wish you well, I wish you peace, I wish you would get the hell off my tail. <laughs> you know, so it's hard. It's hard. We take on these really extraordinary aspirations, and, you know, whether we couch them in spiritual terms or ethical ones or psychological ones, whatever it is, it's, it's hard to get and the Bodhi's office have, what, what they're offering us is, is a way of getting there um, beyond some of our own very, very human and understandable and forgivable failings. Uh, so let me talk about meta now specifically. Um, in the first reading from Chogam Trungpa, the Tibetan teacher, one of the first ones who came over and set up a, a Dharma Center in Colorado. Um, if you've been to Boulder recently, you'd be forgive him for thinking it's kind of a little Tibet in, in some ways. Uh, he was a scandalous character, believed in non-duality to a fault, um, 
and got himself caught up in all kinds of interesting uh, things. One of the things about these Tibetan guys is, you know, they come from celibate backgrounds. That's the, the teaching. And the Indians and Asians don't pay them a whole lot of attention. Sometimes it's just, and they get to the West and they become rock stars. And all of a sudden there are temptations that they would never have to face. And it's a test for them in terms of some of their own Buddhist commitment. So we did a lot of really, really amazing things, but he had, he had some remarkable human failings as well. But he does say in the reading, he says, look, you might need to fake this for a minute. So when we get into the practice, if you want to fake it um, for a minute, no one will mind. Um, oftentimes there's, a, there's some correlations between some of the Buddhist practices and, and Aristotelian thought. Aristotle thought, you know, if there's a virtue that you really wanted, you should adopt it. Take it on. You're going to have to fake it for a while, but eventually, if you practice it long enough, it'll become yours. What we're going to be doing, aiming at now, is the cultivation of a mental disposition, of extending a kind of loving kindness uh, first to some very particular sentient beings and finally to all sentient beings. So put yourself in a, you look comfortable actually, so just as you are, <laughs> that's fine. Um, and close your eyes or not, whatever your suits you best. Uh, and I'll take you through, but this, is, this is a very traditional practice, and it can be done once a day for just a few minutes, or there are entire week, two week, month long devotional practices. Um, it's, it's sometimes also called equanimity practice, opening the heart mantras, uh, goes by some different names. So uh, put an image in your mind of the person or pet, if there's no particular person, closest to you, the most beloved person or pet, and allow yourself, take a minute here, just to feel all the love, all the goodwill, all the wishes you have for, for them or for that pet, all the well-being you wish for them, everything you can muster, and just hold that in mind for a minute and revel. And so for you, that's, that's love. And hopefully you were able to evoke that and, and feel it, not just conceptualize it. Um, and, and hopefully also with it comes the motivation to be kind to that person or pet, uh, at least at your best or most of the time. This particular, this first step is usually not that hard for most people. Uh, if it was difficult for you, you might want to think about changing the person that you think of as closest to you, just saying. Um, the second step in this particular tradition is a little bit more, at least in the West, people report finding it more difficult, and that is to extend that same love, kindness to yourself, to oneself. Um, and so I'll, I'll go back to the second reading. So again, if you will, think of extending that same warmth, wish for well-being, comfort, peace, happiness to yourself. And I'll just uh, read one of the, the, the meta mantra as you do that. May I be peaceful. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be safe. And may I be free from suffering. The third step of the fourth in this particular practice is now putting in mind somebody who's really just neutral. Maybe it's somebody you see on either daily or weekly basis, a cashier, business associate, um, whoever it might be, somebody you don't have strong feelings about one way or, or the other. And uh, this time you can uh, say it in, in your head he, she, or it's a pet. Um, again, same feelings. The ones you evoked for the person that's closest to you. Um, 
may that person be peaceful. May that person be happy. May that person be well. May that person be saved. And may that person be I know you to be an astute audience, so I know you've already figured out where this is going. So you start with the person or that's closest to you, uh, yourself, somebody who's neutral, you don't have strong feelings about one way or the other. And now, in terms of cultivating loving kindness, the spirit of equanimity, universally, right? now you put in mind somebody that you actively dislike. And let me just offer a caveat or suggestion right here at the beginning. If all of you are thinking of our president, maybe let's spread it around a little bit. Somebody, you take somebody else, okay? <laughs> so, somebody you've had conflict with, family member, um, can be somebody in the public eye, of course. Uh, yeah, somebody you maybe have to deal with on a regular basis. Here's where you have to. Check in with yourself. Okay. And if, if as Trungpa said, you know, if you fake it a little bit at first, that's that's all right. And maybe the leap is maybe it's more like a butterfly leap, you know, it's like a little bit forward and then oops, I can climb backwards. <laughs> Why would I do this? The exercise is suspend some of that discernment or judgment, you know, the, the dualistic thinking that we're so prone to. And have this person in mind. May he or she be peaceful. May he or she be happy. May he or she be well. May he or she be safe. May he or she be free from suffering. So the reports that come back from people who do this on a regular basis tend to be along the lines of, I felt my own peacefulness, my own sense of harmony, and my own sense of equanimity, in fact, increase over time. It's not that I necessarily ended up agreeing with the person I was in conflict with, but I didn't initiate or instigate the conflict. And I found myself seeing them in at least a slightly different light as somebody who, like me, wants be happy, wants to be peaceful, may be suffering from a kind of ignorance. I might disagree with them in one way or another, but my approach to them can be non-confrontational, can be done in a different spirit than traditionally is done. Um, how long do you have to do this to see results? That absolutely is up to the individual. You could be karmically ready to you know, switch right into a, a bodhisattva mode, or if you're me, I'm really, the next lifetime, really looking forward to the next lifetime. <laughs> it's going to be great, I'm sure. A um, couple things just from a Buddhist sort of metaphysical or philosophical perspective, and that is wisdom and compassion go hand in hand, but generally speaking, wisdom comes first. And the reason for that is that if you see deeply into the nature of reality, if you understand how things are dependently originated, that uh, things don't have their own being. Things do rise and fall, etc. You begin to understand the nature of grasping and the nature of how, why we construct so much of our own suffering and then impute that or project that onto to others. Those insights tend to be critical because the Buddhists say once you really do understand how suffering arises, how it continues, the ways in which we fuel it, much more prone to 
take on a compassionate point of view for yourself and others that has fuel behind it that we can withstand the burnout that, that comes from simply trying to affect or adapt compassion. However, however, here's the good news. If you're just faking it, right? And if you're just going to practice loving kindness for the next 20, 30, 40 years, even though you haven't achieved enlightenment, deep insight into the nature, true nature of reality, the good news is from a traditional Buddhist point of view, you still get to be reborn in the God realm, and that's not all you have to do. So, so thank you. May you be peaceful. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe.